Legal panel is Beyond Roads and Bridges, discussing the needs, bringing the needs of women and low-income families into the transportation discussion. And so the format for our panel is going to go like this. Um, each of us, including me, will um, do a brief introduction, one to two minutes, and each of us is going to talk about a different uh, transportation perspective. And so we can mention that in our introduction. And then following that, um, so short introduction, and then following that, each of us will talk a bit longer, seven to eight minutes, you know, uh, come what may, about the transportation perspective we're bringing. I'm also going to encourage the panel uh, to be informal, and so, you know, if you want to add to something that somebody has said, you know, or ask a question, please do. And if we have time at the end, uh, we can take questions uh, as well, and comments as long as they're short. Okay. So, with that, uh, as Deb said, I'm Lori Janitopoulos. I'm the planning director at Arrowhead Economic Opportunity Agency. We're a community action agency serving the seven counties of northeastern Minnesota. So our work is all about um, helping low-income people um, and others who struggle. And so uh, transportation, the perspective that I'm going to bring is a rural perspective because we're very rural outside the city of Duluth. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Representative Connie Bernardi. Thank you very much. I'm Connie Bernardi, and I represent the, represent the community of New Brighton, Fridley, and Spring Lake Park. This is my fifth term in the legislature. I was in from 2000 to 2006, or 2000, about that time, and then took off six years and then uh, came back again during redistricting. Didn't want to miss out on my children's life, so I'm um, really glad I did that. I have served as the vice chair of the Transportation Committee and um, currently serve on the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Thanks. And my name is Shalon Wilson. I'm a program associate at the Wilder Foundation and also a member of the Prosperity for All Coalition. Um, and in my work, I support community leaders, um, help develop their leadership skills and qualities, um, so that way they could, we could build the capacity of communities, and particularly of communities of color. Uh, Kimmy again. So in this capacity, I am um, a member of the uh, transportation, I'm an AMET Council appointee to the Transportation Advisory Board, um, which sits as our state's metropolitan planning organization. Um, I've been on the board since 2011, and it heavily deals with uh, federal, the federal regional solicitation process. So essentially, all the money that Met Council gets from the federal government um, at one point was significant, but now it's at $100 million. Um, we govern um, and decide on regional transportation projects throughout the region. Um, and in that, I also um, actually just completed a Bush Fellowship focused on um, transportation as I started working in North Minneapolis on the Botano. So from that, I say I'm a uh, trusted community advocate and a regional leader that focuses on transportation equity. Now, there, okay, great. So I'll just start a bit and talk a little bit about the rural perspective from, uh, transportation rural perspective from um, my role as planning director at a community action agency. Um, every three years, and when I say very rural, um, one part of our area from um, Aiken County, it would take you six hours to drive to Grand Marais. And so our area is very, very rural. And where we live, you need a car to get to work. I live on the end of a dead-end road on 22 acres, and I go uh, into work. It takes me a half an hour. And so for low-income people, in order to get a job and keep a job, they need a vehicle. Um, the, we do have, uh, AUA runs a public transit system, but it doesn't really uh, work as needed for workforce transportation. We do a community needs assessment every three years where we interview low-income people about what their needs are. And uh, our last, most recent assessment was in 2012. And we interviewed nearly 300 community members. And of those, 
65% reported repairing a car that they own was a problem, and 66% of those that answered the survey reported that they had to repair their car in the last month previous to the survey. And the repairs aren't, you know, the cars that low-income families drive are not necessarily you know, top of the line cars. And the repairs fall um, heavily, $300, $500, $1,000. Um, and to give you a feel for that, I just wanted to tell you about three, three families that we saw last year briefly um, who needed help uh, with their cars. Um, the, first, the first woman was a 22-year-old uh, single mom, uh, infant at home. Um, and she was on the Minnesota Family Investment Program and needed her vehicle to get to work, but the, the tires um, actually went, a tire went on it, and so she needed uh, $150 uh, to get two tires so that she could continue work. Uh, another family was a um, family of five, a two-parent family. Um, the, tie rods and ball joints went in the 1999 vehicle that had 103,431 miles on it. They were in early Head Start. They were working. Um, they needed $517 to repair their car so that they could continue. Um, in the meantime, the father in the family who had um, the job was taking a bicycle and or walking to work um, while they were waiting for the repair. Um, the third family was a, is missing from my list here, <laughs> but um, basically the third family was a, um, a single mom, again, who was 25 years old, who needed a repair of her car, um, and she needed brake work done. And she had been driving it because she needed it to get to work, and uh, we were able to help her with it, too. So again, in rural areas, car personal vehicles are necessities, and we need programs that will help people with their car repair um, in order to go to work. So with that, Connie. Okay. Thank you very much. First, I want to start out with a little uh, today to talk a little bit about your lives. Some of you might be part of a sandwich generation where you're caring for an aging parent. I'm seeing heads nod now. Aging parents and young children. Or you might be the primary income earner in your family. Or perhaps you make 80 cents on the dollar of someone in a comparable job at your company. So let me ask you a few questions. I, I'm calling this the have you ever quiz. So have you, uh, just raise your hands if you feel comfortable. Have you ever had to get your child from an after school program or to home or to an, an after school opportunity before you got off work? Okay. Have you ever had to find a way to get an aging parent to a medical appointment while you are at work? Oh, we're getting some oh yeahs now, okay. Have you ever made less than what a man made for the same type of job? Yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> Have you ever owned a car that wasn't very reliable because it's all you could afford? I'll get some yes in there, okay. Um, have you ever had to turn down a job because you couldn't juggle work with your family, family's transportation needs? Okay, so on that one too. And have you or your child experienced asthma-related problems because of the poor air quality? Okay. And then lastly, have you ever driven your child to school because you were concerned about them having a safe route to school, a safe route to bike or walk to school? Okay. They call it like the kissing line where the parents are dropping their kids off and it actually makes it very unsafe for people to even be mobile through the parking lots. So what is the common thread of all the questions I asked you? And a lot of people had raised their hands for a number of those. Transportation. Transportation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. I appreciate it. Um, the common thread is that women need transportation for themselves and for their families to get to sa places safely and efficiently. So as you know, and you're probably um, fitting these categories too, women often are primary caregivers for family members, young and old. They often make 80 cents on the dollar as a man makes for the same job. 
they run a household, they may be a head of a household, or they might be the primary care uh, earners in their families. They run many of their family errands and often are taxis for their families. And um, they make up two thirds of the min minimum wage jobs in Minnesota. And disproportionately, women in their elder years live in poverty disproportionately to men. So this is a very timely topic um, at this summit because our transportation system is crumbling. So now is the time to make the kind of changes we need in Minnesota. And we need women at the table, and we need women's voices heard. We must consider women every step along the way as we build and maintain our transportation system. We must work together to ensure we and our family members from ages 1 to 101 of all abilities and incomes and in all zip codes have the freedom to move about safely, have clean water to drink and clean air to breathe, and we can move into economic prosperity and be secure. We and our families need access to safe, efficient, and accessible transportation system that is sustainable throughout our life. This is why today you will hear me talk about the importance of women's voices and families being heard, and about oversight and accountability. Working together, we can make Minnesota stronger and better. We need to ensure that you and your family's needs are being addressed, your civil rights are being upheld, and that there is leadership to truly address our transportation for all people. It's not just about money, funding, and revenue. It's also about people and how we spend our money. Today, let's come together and really start addressing Minnesota's transportation problem in a comprehensive way and address the needs of women and their families in our transportation system. Let's not fool ourselves and get in the trap of it's an all or nothing proposition, that a big check with lots of, bunch of zeros behind it is the sole answer. Our transportation challenges are not just about funding. Our current transportation discussion and solutions on the table are incomplete. We must not miss this chance to step up and really solve our transportation problems. We need to make sure that our next steps are innovative and inclusive so that we resolve our problems, transportation problems for all Minnesotans, including women and their families, and not just lessen the funding shortfall to our transportation agencies. What we have been doing hasn't been working. Moving cars fast through our main streets and communities does not meet the complex needs of women. Women's voices must be heard. We can count on others who are managing our transportation systems to represent us and know the complexities and challenges we face in our daily lives. We have to stand up, speak up, and be heard. It's our civil right. We must change how our transportation system is being planned, designed, maintained, and operated and built. We, our state must become compliant with federal and state civil rights laws and regulations, environmental justice, and other laws that build the kind of intermodal transportation system that will help meet the needs in the link of women and low-income families. As women, we need to be part of the discussion of Minnesota's transportation future. Women's voices need to be heard. Working together, we can make Minnesota stronger and better. Paying for our transportation system often hits women harder than men. As we talked about earlier, as you know, women often make 80 cents on the dollar that a man makes. So when we ask to pay for this transportation system, it's likely going to hit women harder. And we need to be sure that their needs in transportation are going to be addressed. And I like to say when women's needs are being addressed, it's likely good for families and everyone else. <laughs> Barbara, and I hope I get Batista, I don't, I don't know, Batiste, okay, um, from the Legislative Office of Economic Status of Women, went around the state to hear what the matters relating to economic status for women this past summer. And I want to say what she uncovered is pioneering and um, helping us raise this issue of transportation that meets the needs of women. The main issue that she found out, or one of the, it was the top issue, which she told me almost in every region, was transportation. 
These are the things that women had to say. They had no public transportation as available for second and third shift workers. Low income, women, low income families often don't have cars or unreliable cars. The high price of gas also cur curtails the affordability of private transportation for people of low or modest incomes. Parents, especially single mothers, offer, often rely on public transportation to take their children to childcare in the morning. An added complication is a reluctance or refusal of bus buses and taxis to allow baby strollers. High cost of housing and population centers results in low-income families having to live in more remote towns where housing is more affordable. This, leaving its, this leaves the expensive and logistically difficult problem of finding transportation to work for um, work in the population centers. And then a couple more things they found out, or well, one more thing is transportation is also a problem in accessing uh, support services for families like food shops or people getting to farmers markets and those sorts of things even to take tests for um, high school graduation and then one thing i wanted to add to this is um and in, in uh, elderly women it also had commented later down in the report it wasn't actually the transportation part but transportation is a very big issue for them and the minnesota department of health had done a study or survey and they found out the number one issue was tied with three. 85% of the people said that their biggest problem to get getting access to health care was transportation. 85% of the people. It was equal with access to mental health services and, and access to health insurance. So it is a huge issue. And it's interwoven in a lot of the, the complexities of our lives. So writing a big check for ref, writing a big check without reform or hearing the needs of women in Minnesota and their families will only speed up or make worse our nation's leading disparity gaps in our state. We have some of the largest disparity gaps in the nation. Disparities in gender, health, income, race, and education hurts our state. We need to address these huge disparity gaps that our transportation system causes or makes worse. Transportation is a key link to connect people to opportunities. Unfortunately, we have built and continue to build disparities in our transportation system that are affecting people now and for generations into the future. I have a lot more that I could add, um, but I do want to leave you with this that the alarm has been set off. We need real system change now. We must stop having to put out fires on transportation project after transportation project. We need a long-range vision that helps meet the needs of Minnesota futures, whether you're caring for an elderly parent that has transportation, whether you have a child who's a millennial and has huge college debt and can't find a job and needs to have transportation choices. And frankly, they don't want to have free freedom for millennial is not having a car. When I grew up, freedom was getting your driver's license. And now they want a smartphone. And they want to move about bike, walk, public transportation. And what's interesting about that is businesses are now looking to where the millennials are moving because they now move to find the places that they're, where they want to live that are multimodal or intermodal is what I like to call it. And then businesses and then they find a job, then the millennials look for a job, and then businesses are moving to where the millennials are moving. So this is really important to our economic competitiveness. So what I want to offer to you is to have your voice be heard on this. If you're a part of organizations, start bringing up transportation as a women's issue. If you care about this and want to share your interest in this with me, I'd, I'd be grateful for that. You know, Contact our Commissioner of Transportation. He, he gets the multimodal part of our transportation system. He's very receptive to listening to things. And we need him to change the system within MnDOT to be able to hear women's voices, to be inclusive, to actually hear everyone's voice. So we create the kind of transportation system that's going to make us competitive, not only for our state, but help be able to lift people up into economic prosperity and security. We need to change how our system does this currently. So thank you for um, being here today. And I hope that we join together and really 
make something big of our transportation system that meets the needs of all Minnesotans. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Um, so again, my name is Shalon, and so I'm coming from the Prosperity for All Coalition, and for those who may not know, the Prosperity for All Coalition is a um, statewide alliance with about 12 partnerships, um, and their work is, our work is centered around um, advocating for um, families who are in the Infip Minnesota Family Investment Program. Um, and as we know that um, women are disproportionately rooted through that, to that program. Um, so um, just to give a little bit of context um, about Minnesota's landscape, which I'm sure you guys have been hearing, um, there is a shortage of workers. There's a sh um, it's predicted that about 70% of jobs in Minnesota um, are going to require some form of higher education or training. Um, and there's also a large pool of low wage and low skilled workers. And so there's a, a great opportunity for us to fill that gap. Um, and so we've had some accomplishments um, in which, for example, last year the workforce education bill was passed that allowed um, the women and families on those programs to get more access to education and training opportunities. Um, so they can take unlimited ESL, uh, they can take adult basic education, or even seek a four year degree, which they prior to that, they were not able to do. Um, so we're really uh, moving towards a more affirmative space when it comes to talking about the MFIT program, uh, because the last um, decade or so has been really spent on the defense, defending it, defending things like uh, DWI um, testing and, and drug testing and things like that. And so now we're moving to a more affirmative space, um, and we're really working to change the narrative that is around the MFIT program, because it's not just a welfare program. Program. Um, it really is a program that, um, it's an employment program. It's a program that's designed to, or wh whose goal, I should say, is um, to really move families towards economic stability. Um, so what we're doing this year, the Prosperity for All Coalition, uh, we're working on a MFIP workforce transportation bill. And what this bill will do is families who are in the MFIP program, uh, they will receive, uh, receive a $100 increase um, during their monthly benefits. Um, as many people may know, it has been since 1986 that we have had an increase on the MFIT grant. So families right now, family of three, um, will actually uh, be granted $532 to survive off during a month. And I am a single adult, but I have been low income up until three months ago. Thank you. Um, and I know how hard it is, um, especially with transportation, to, to move forward and, and really take yourself out of that. Um, and so we're working to get this um, $100 grant increase. Um, and we're not tying any constraints to it. Uh, we're not saying like you have to submit receipts for gas and, and this and that of that nature. Um, we're just advocating for a flat $100 increase to be awarded to all families on the MFIT program. Um, and what we hope this will do is, um, so last year when we had that education bill passed um, that allowed them to actually take advantage of the education and training opportunities, um, we're hoping that this $100 will support their transportation costs so they can actually get to those opportunities because one thing that we know, especially when it comes to women, is that transportation is a huge barrier. Um, I've seen it myself. I have friends who, um, you know, they have several kids and they're riding public transportation. Um, and it's costly. Um, I know as a bus rider, it costs $85 for one monthly bus pass. Imagine if you have a car, if you have insurance costs, if you have license costs, if you have tabs costs, and things like that, and it's very costly. And transportation is a big barrier to getting stable employment, and a big barrier to getting em uh, taking advantage of those employment opportunities um, that are higher paying. Um, so I think you mentioned that two thirds of women are on minimum wage jobs. Um, there's of an minimum, of minimum wage jobs. Two of, of minimum wage jobs, two thirds are women. So it's important that as we have this increase in these jobs that are requiring this more education, more education, that we are eliminating barriers such as transportation to get them to those jobs. So um, we're really looking forward. Um, 
the support of our legislature to go ahead and grant us this increase. And uh, we're looking to have those funds come from the TANF funds, uh, which those funds are supposed to support programs such as MFIT, but we know that they have been allocated elsewhere to, um, to, other, to other entities. And so that funding is not available to us. So we're really trying hard to get that funding so we can get that grant increase this year. So, so I want to start with a little um, historical perspective of transportation and its function, behavior, um, and uh, impact on communities of color. And we can start right here in Minnesota with the Rondo community. Um, and let's talk about transportation, um, not as a mobile tool, but as a planning tool. Um, much of transportation is about um, planning. It's about economic development. It's about structure. It's about um, creating access. It's about a system by which people thrive in some way or another. And a lot of my work is focused on transportation planning, policy, and finance. And um, I should say that I, I really have no idea how I ended up in transportation. I'm supposed to be a civil rights activist. So. <laughs> That's a place to be, right? Yeah. And um, I went to a conference in um, North Carolina uh, called the Smart Growth Conference in 2010. And what I seen unfold in front of me was the future of the United States over the next 35 years. And I immediately became nervous and my anxiety rose high because I knew there was no way in the world my community was prepared for what I was looking at. What I seen was how this country was going to be redesigned, planned, and developed which meant that most of us would be eliminated from the environments that we live in. And transportation was the tool that was going to make that happen. That's what that conference laid out. It's a conference that a lot of developers across the country attend. And um, so I met a guy uh, named Daniel um, Hutchinson from the uh, Washington, D.C. EPA Environmental Protection Agency. And we talked. And I just had general conversation. He said, you know, you should get into regional planning. I had no clue what that was. And he talked about how people of color need to be in these areas because this is where the blueprint for development, um, community development happens. And so um, I said, OK. So I, did, I knew nothing about what Met Council was. Um, I only knew about Metro Transit from the bus because we grew up using the bus. And so um, I went online. And at the time, I worked for a business development agency uh, called the Northside Economic Opportunity Network. And I was trying to find ways to connect my work to this new equity buzzword. Um, and so that's why I went to the conference to begin. And I researched, and I found Met Council. And they had this opening for this transportation advisory board. And I thought, wow, yeah, I should get on the advisory board so I can be advised about what's going on. you know. Um, and I had no idea it was one of the most um, powerful citizen boards in the country um, with the power and the authority that it has. And um, being the first African-American person to ever be on the board in 30, in its 39 years, it was also the youngest. And um, a, a board made up of county commissioners, mayors, uh, city council persons, and um, some citizen reps. but. It was, if you ever want to know about regional planning and, and really what's going on in our state around transportation, that is the board um, where you will get the most diverse perspective of regional transportation planning and policy. There's no other board that exists um, like it in the country, actually. At any rate, being on this board um, and then having the Bush Fellowship, I got to do a lot of, a lot of research and take two years um, to actually be privileged, because a lot of people don't have the time and opportunity to do that. So I got to explore this entire region and dig into some history. And some of what I found um, was the Rondo community. It was about the expansion of Highway 94. So we ride on it now, and we're happy to have access between St. Paul and Minneapolis. And some of us have no idea that what you're riding through is the middle of the black community. You're riding through the middle of what used to be our cultural environments, where we lived, where we raised families, where we slept, where we ate, where we had businesses. This is where our life existed in Minnesota. 
before we highly populated North Minneapolis, because that is the place now where most of the black people in the state of Minnesota live in North Minneapolis. But that was after right, this disruption. And so transportation was used to disrupt, I, I should say the intent perhaps was not about disrupting our community. It was about expanding access for people to travel to and fro. But the consideration of human life, particularly our human life, did not rise as a top priority um, for you know, us being able to be maintained in our own communities. And so now we have a split where we're on both sides. Um, and we call that, and, and so the Rondo Day celebration that we have every year is in recognition of that community, in case you didn't know. So if you um, want to go out and support, every year we have the, the big celebration um, in memory of our community, um, which you can find a lot of the history inside of the Holly Q. Brown Center in St. Paul. So I'm a North Sider, but I do understand that history of our community here in Minnesota. Um, while the same has happened in North Minneapolis as it relates to Olson Memorial Highway, okay, which used to also be a very uh, thriving cultural business corridor in the African American community, once again, the priority was to expand access to the um, Northwest, North Southwest, however you want to call it, region. And so, once again, in a, a, a highway was developed in the middle of our community, and now we're still divided. So there's a lower end of North Minneapolis, which is known as Harrison Neighborhood, and then there's the other half. So, so this practice can be found throughout the entire country. And the last piece I'll leave you on in terms of the history of planning of how transportation has impacted our community, and I haven't even begun to talk about the usage, how we use transportation. I haven't talked about the disparities in the access and the lack of real opportunity that we have. So while we say it is a woman's issue, it is very much a civil rights issue that impacts people of color far more greater than anyone because we are the largest population of transit users in Minnesota, one, um, particularly North Minneapolis, but two, um, we are transit dependent, so we're not just using it for work. This is our life, and there's a difference in that. And so we are investors in the transit system. We don't get free bus passes necessarily. We pay for it. So we're investors. And what we're seeing is that the money is not returning to our community because we're still fighting for basic bus amenities, right? We talk about the families and um, having accommodations on the bus. But we can even go so far as to talk about the bus shelters. Right? The way they're designed and how, they, how you can see a woman with a stroller on a place where there's a bus stop, but there's not even a bench. Right? Those sort of things. And so, um, but you, you would only find this primarily in our communities. And once again, I want to say that we are investors in transit on different ends. We pay taxes too, right? From the Women of Color Forum, you see contributions to the tax base. So we pay, we pay taxes, but on, the, on top of that, we also pay for this transit system, but we're not seeing the return in an equitable way in our communities through access to more bus routes, faster bus service times, even bus amenities. Um, we, but we're seeing an ex expansion in Greater Minnesota, which I don't want to undermine that because there's still equity issues there that they need. But what we are seeing is that our money is going to help going into expanding bus services there where we do see things like Wi-Fi, coach buses, and things that we like to have ourselves. And so I will, um, if I can, one last thing about transportation planning. And, and, and again, I'll get to the uses later, but the planning is critical because we, we need to understand this um, historically, um, but it's still continuing. So in Minneapolis, I think the oldest plan, um, planning, uh, the community development plan in Minneapolis, designated North Minneapolis to be what we call, what was called a Negro slum. So there's an actual map, and, and you can see it. And, it, and it designated immigrant communities, Native American communities, um, African American communities, and it called the white and Jewish communities Gold Coast. So, so there's a map where we're segmented and it was, a tra it was, again, planning. Transportation, again, is about planning, not just a bus, right? It's an entire system. And so this is the original plan 
of Minneapolis. And so when you, you talk about disparities, when you talk about uh, some of the, you know, African, let's just say African American because I'm African American, um, it is no surprise to me why, why North Minneapolis has some of the economics and, and crime and other issues that it has. Competency is not at the bottom of it. It's not a matter of just education. We, we should be very clear about that. We, we're some of the most educated people in this country. That's not the issue. The issue is these structural barriers that are created and designed to put us at a disadvantage and segregate us into these silos that block us from real access to opportunities to succeed in life. That is the point here. Great. What a good moderator. And I drop, I drop the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kenya. That's that's great. So we heard we've heard a lot about the intersection now of transportation, women, civil rights, low income um, necessities to get to work. And we heard a little bit about Prosperity for All, which is a um, a bill that's going to be moving through the legislature, hopefully to add $100 to the uh, MFIP cash grant. Are there other bills, Connie? I'm just wondering, Representative Bernardi, are there other, what are the other legislative moves that you know about or that anybody knows about that's, that are uh, happening now in the legislature on transportation and these issues? Hmm. And I know you don't, I mean, there's a lot. Okay, um, well, I'll just say that there, I mean, there's, there's bills going forward for transportation funding, but buyer beware. What kind of transportation system are those new dollars going to produce? If it's going to be the same old, same old, in what Kenya's been talking about, and um, what I talked about, not meeting, um, being built for all people, then we just might be accelerating a problem and make it worse. And I am very much for more transportation funding to build out the transportation system that actually our transportation agency has for a vision, which is uh, to maximize the health of individuals, our economy, and our environment. If we have a system that actually does that, we need the funding to do that because our roads are crumbling and our bridges are crumbling and our transit system is not sufficient to be competitive in the 21st century. So we need both, and so we have to be very cautious and careful that these things happen at the same time so we get the kind of system we want with these new investment dollars. If I can add up, so Governor Dayton just um, introduced this new transportation bill that um, I think is very comprehensive. So in addition to my policy um, work at the, on the tab, I am a part of the Move Minnesota Coalition. How many people have heard of Move Minnesota? Okay, so we're a statewide coalition um, of folks who uh, work across the transportation sector. And that's from roads to bridges, to bikes, to pedestrian, to bus, to you name it, we're there. Engineers, um, riders, everyone's there. And for the first time in history, um, last year, we all came together to fight for uh, the whole transportation system, um, which is historic um, because typically we're the legislator fighting um, saying it's either road or bridges, or it's either bus and bike and pedestrian. So what was important um, for 2015 is that we knew that uh, transportation would be a high priority for the governor because, once again, um, in order for Minnesota to be competitive uh, regionally across the country, we need to build a robust transportation system, which we currently do not have, in case, just so you know. And um, what that means is that we need to make sure our infrastructure is, is, is straight, is, is strengthened. That is our roads and bridges, right? Most of our roads are outdated, and so safety is a high priority. Um, our bridges, we've seen the 35W bridge collapse. We want to prevent that in the future. A lot of, lot of folks lost their lives, um, but it, and, it, and it, it is a priority for our governor to invest in um, a multimodal transit system. So that's what Move Minnesota represents, um, and we're pushing for a half cent. Um, increase sales tax to pay for a long-term approach to transportation rather than every two years we come up and have the same conversation and we re-decide what's a priority. Well, a long-term 10-year approach will help us put together a system 
that's strong enough, that's sustainable, that don't have to be compromised every two years. So that's what the governor's um, proposal um, presents as well as what Move Minnesota's putting forth. Great, thank you. And I just want everybody to know before we open it up and we just have a little time, maybe 10 minutes or so left, um, that um, as Kenya was talking about the transportation and planning being so um, integral to that, that I am a good planner as planning director that I don't plan things that would be bad. So just so you know that. Okay, so I was, I was worried about that. So we are encouraged. Um, I think I see. This one's not working. There. Right here, you didn't get your question in last Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jean Lee, President and Executive Director, Children's Hope International, r, &R Family Centers in APAC, the uh, housing consortium. Now, uh, with Department of Transportation, they have been, uh, I guess, progressive as far as inclusion of women and minority-owned businesses, and also they added veteran-owned businesses. However, they're talking about the for-profits only. So in a section of Department of Administration's uh, legislation, we have tried to expand it to include uh, women or, or the nonprofits along with the, the for-profits. And so I think that there's mo there could be changes as far as the Minnesota money versus what the federal says, I mean, you're talking two different pots of money. So I'm wondering to what extent you could help move it so that a lot of the nonprofits that are led or run by um, women-owned, veteran, women-owned, and so forth, minorities could get better access to some of those funds. Ideas? Uh, to do workforce training or to, to, to do what exactly? Oh, okay. The one thing I want to say is that, so it is my opinion that MnDOT has a lot of work to do um, as it relates to uh, uh, workforce inclusion of minority, um, minority, and uh, particularly people of color. Let, let me not play with the word. The bottom line is that white women are considered minorities as well, and so the majority of the minority contractors go to white women. Let's be very clear about that. That is not a real benefit to people of color. So even over um, men, in this case, white women advance um, in the procurement contracts for profit businesses in the MnDOT system, while the white men are typically the general contractors, white women are the sub, and then sometimes their family. But um, that's, I, I just wanna make that really clear, that's something that's on our radar, um, something that why we moved in with, um, Men died. When I say we, I was a part of the Higher Minnesota. Many people heard of Higher Minnesota. Okay, so we do workforce advocacy for people of color, and so we set up what is called the Men Dot Collaborative. I in, invite you to be a part of that, which is um, a collaboration between labor unions, um, general contractors, subcontractors, community-based agencies, um, the commissioner of Men Dot, Mr. Charlie Zelli, who's very great, by the way. Um, to talk about how to strengthen our relationships and opportunities because um, some of our partners are nonprofit and that's how they gain access is through the MnDOT Collaborative. One more question. Um, uh, right here. Uh, I was, um, I didn't know if Sister Kenya is aware of a meeting this evening at five o'clock at the UROC about putting a train through the North Minneapolis section, which a lot of us will be just about like we did when we tried to move out uh, Olson Highway and Plymouth, when to put another, it caused a lot of us to be um, homeless there. But they planning on having a big meeting this evening at UROC, which I'm planning on attending. So did you know? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The botno. Great. The botno. Yes, ma'am. I'm aware. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that um, wraps up our time. And I believe we have some closing remarks. Yep. So just stick around for a few more minutes. Thank you, panelists. Great job.